On this Monday night, powerful earthquakes jolting Japan. Well, the whole room was shaking. The deaths, the devastation, and the panic. Israel pulling back from Gaza. The reason to release some reservists and the military's next focus. Preparing for a possible recession in Canada. What money experts say you should do. Plus, a new year ushers in a new era for sports. We're just as good as the boys. The first professional women's hockey league game and how the goal for equity has yet to be achieved. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Carolyn Jarvis. Good evening and thanks for joining us. A powerful 7.6 magnitude earthquake has rocked central Japan, killing at least six people with many more feared dead. The quake struck just after 4 p.m. local time. Dozens of buildings collapsed, trapping people inside. Thousands spent the night in evacuation centers after the quake triggered tsunami warnings along the country's west coast. The epicenter was in Ishikawa Prefecture, but the quake was reportedly felt by people in Tokyo 300 kilometers away. Dozens of aftershocks have also been reported. Some tsunami warnings have now been lowered, though many residents on the country's west coast have been told not to return home. Nithu Garcha reports. Hey, Emma. With surreal and scary sights like this road cracking open, many in Japan started the new year with a series of strong earthquakes. It is quite scary. This tourist in Japan's Hakuba Valley says he's thankful to be safe. The whole room was shaking, the TV was shaking. I had to keep um, everything um, on the table. According to the Japan Meteorological Agency, more than a dozen quakes struck in the Sea of Japan near Ishikawa, prompting tsunami warnings for the length of the country's western coast. The agency initially issued Japan's highest level tsunami alert before downgrading it several hours later. You can see all the snow from the uh, electric wire goes down and also from the roof go down and all the car is shaking and so everybody was, was panicked that time. The quake struck just after 4 p.m. local time, starting a fire, collapsing dozens of buildings in several towns and trapping people beneath the rubble. The government said more than 97,000 people in nine coastal prefectures were evacuated and may be in shelters for a few days. Well, it's of course devastating. <laughs> BC Earth scientist Jessica Polarzik, who led a research team focused on Japan's geological history, says this was a shallow event, just 10 kilometers below the Earth's surface, contributing to the scale of destruction. 10 kilometers isn't quite that much of a distance, so there wasn't really a lot of energy dissipation occurring in between when the earthquake happened and when those waves, uh, seismic waves, reached the Earth's surface. More than 30,000 homes lost power as the country now grapples with warnings of aftershocks over the next few days. Nitu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. Japan is one of the most earthquake-prone countries in the world. It's located on the so-called Ring of Fire, a string of volcanoes and sites of seismic activity around the edge of the Pacific Ocean. In March 2011, Japan experienced the strongest earthquake in its recorded history, the 9.1 magnitude quake triggered a deadly tsunami that killed nearly 20,000 people. In the Middle East, fighting between Israel and Hamas did not stop as the rest of the world rang in the new year. Sirens blared just moments into 2024 as Hamas launched a barrage of rockets from Gaza into Israel right at the stroke of midnight. The group says the attack was in response to the massacre of civilians in Gaza. Israel says it intercepted 18 of 27 rockets that were fired. There were no reports of casualties. Palestinians inside Gaza also have little to celebrate for New Year's as Israeli forces continue their offensive. But there are signals the assault may be entering a new phase, with Israel announcing it will soon be withdrawing some of its reservist troops. Redmond Shannon reports. Close to one million children inside Gaza are not spending this new year at home. For many, the homes they fled are in ruins, alongside their hopes for the year ahead. I wish not to die in 2024, says 11-year-old Leanne. We have no bathroom, no food and no water. Our childhood is gone. 
above their heads, rockets fired toward Israel are intercepted. Hamas calling the barrage revenge for Israel's massacre of civilians. On the ground, fighting rages into the new year too. Israel claiming it killed a Hamas commander involved in the October 7th attacks. But for the first time since then, Israel's military says it will pull back on some of its operations in Gaza, withdrawing some reservists for now to get them back into their day jobs in Israel's economy and to move toward more localized attacks on Hamas targets in Gaza over the coming months. Well, I think it's part of the whole um, Israeli military plan in Gaza Strip. Basically, it was expected. Meaning... Former Israeli intelligence official Avi Malamed says he expects a focus on the southern city of Khan Yunus and the Egypt-Gaza border, a target that Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu says he wants to control. One of the major sources of Hamas' huge incoming um, uh, smuggling of weapons and, and ammunitions and many other things is actually a huge, massive network of tunnels that Hamas dug beneath the Hamas, the Gaza and Egypt border. Across from Gaza's other border inside Israel, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant spoke from a kibbutz devastated in the October 7th attacks. He said members of some of those communities will be able to return home soon. Whether any of those traumatized survivors will want to go back is another matter. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Israel's Supreme Court has struck down a controversial judicial reform which sparked outrage and nationwide protests against the Netanyahu government last year. An 8-7 to seven ruling overturned a law that would have limited the Supreme Court's power to void government decisions that were deemed unreasonable. A summary of the court's decision says the law would severely damage Israel's democracy. Prior to Hamas's attack, protesters accused the government of being authoritarian. The law also drew concern from international allies. The United States, meanwhile, says it will be withdrawing the world's largest warship from the eastern Mediterranean Sea. The USS Gerald Ford and its accompanying ships are set to head home in the coming days. They've been on extended deployment since being redirected to within striking distance of Israel in response to Hamas's October 7th attack. They will be replaced by three other warships heading to the region. At least five deaths have been reported after a series of New Year's Day attacks between Russia and Ukraine. In the Russian-occupied city of Donetsk, officials say four people were killed and more than a dozen injured, following what Moscow claims to be heavy Ukrainian shelling. Kyiv, meanwhile, says Russia launched record overnight drone attacks that left at least one person dead and multiple others injured in the port city of Odessa. It's the latest in a back-and-forth series of deadly aerial bombardments from both sides, which Russian President Vladimir Putin has vowed to intensify. We have no desire to fight indefinitely, Putin told a room of injured Russian soldiers today, but we are not going to give up our positions. Putin also called strikes on the Russian border city of Belgorod that killed 25 people Saturday a terrorist act and warned of more strikes targeting Ukrainian military facilities. In his annual New Year's address, Chinese President Xi Jinping said Taiwan will surely be reunified with China. Xi's comments come just two weeks before Taiwan's next presidential and parliamentary elections that could reshape relations. China has ramped up military pressure on Taiwan ahead of the elections. Taiwan considers itself distinct from mainland China and has democratically elected leaders, while China considers Taiwan to be part of its territory and believes the two should be unified. Over 200 people in the Netherlands were arrested during New Year's Eve riots. Police in several cities were attacked with fireworks and stones. Authorities in Rotterdam say more than 100 vehicles were set on fire, while in Amsterdam and The Hague, riot squads dispersed violent crowds. And a 19-year-old man reportedly died of injuries from a fireworks incident just before midnight. Here at home, the start of the new year also means a fresh start for professional women's hockey in North America. It wasn't the start the hometown crowd was hoping for, but history was made in Toronto nonetheless, as New York and Toronto faced off in the inaugural game of the new Professional Women's Hockey League. Our Sean O'Shea was at the game to catch all the excitement for what many hope is just the beginning of a growing league. 
The lineup of fans stretched up the street, fans who came to witness hockey history. I'm just excited to like watch them play the first game. The first game of the new professional women's hockey league, a sellout of the former Maple Leaf Gardens. We finally have a league that's like all together and not just like a couple different leagues. Six teams in a league billing itself as the first of its kind, though there has been some women's pro hockey in the past. It's a really big day for women's hockey and hopefully we'll grow up and be able to play in this league. Players arrive through the arena's front door with the fans, something you won't see in other professional sports. It's a great day. Toronto versus New York. None of the teams have names yet or logos. That will happen in the offseason. The league says the key was getting teams on the ice. We do not have competing egos or competing budgets or things like that. We are all in this together. Players earn an average of $55,000 a year. Elite players can make $80,000 a year. A small number compared to what male pro athletes make around the world. Billy Jean King! Before the game, tennis legend and advisory board member Billy Jean King took the ice and dropped the puck in the ceremonial face-off. Then it was game time. The first goal in the new league was scored 11 minutes in by New York's Ella Shelton, something to remember in a trivia contest. The league's head of hockey operations, a Hall of Famer herself, said the day is an emotional one for her. Uh, for women that played the game and uh, before me and my generation, it's such a proud moment to see we, us finally get to this point. New York won the first game 4 nothing. It's huge. The idea that I'm a path maker for a bunch of young girls going into hockey. Um, it's pretty exciting that they know that they can now watch professional women's hockey on the TV and, and grow up to be just like one of us and chase that dream of playing professional. The score less important to fans who wanted a chance to see some of the best female players. People shouldn't think that we, we aren't as good as the boys. I think that we're just as good as the boys. And now a professional league to prove that. Sean O'Shea, Global News, Toronto. And now a professional league to prove that. Sean O'Shea, Global News, Toronto. And in professional men's hockey, the NHL held its annual Winter Classic in Seattle with the city's Kraken and the Vegas Golden Knights playing around with fashion. Seattle donning some gear honoring the city's popular fish market, while Vegas dressed as who else but the king, Elvis Presley himself. Money is top of mind for many Canadians. Coming up, how experts say you can be ready for a recession just in case one hits. Well, the holidays may have been a good excuse to splurge a bit, but if you're among the countless Canadians bracing for your credit card bill, perhaps your New Year's resolution will be about getting into financial shape. That could mean paying down debt, boosting your savings, or investing wisely. And Gaviola has more on how to make the most of money-related resolutions. New year, new financial landscape. Money experts say 2024 should include preparing for the recession many economists have been predicting. In a recession, the best thing that you can do is have manageable debt payments. So if you were to lose your job or if your income was to slow down, could you still pay your mortgage? Could you still make your debt obligations? This personal finance expert says slaying or taming debt should be top of mind for many households. If debt isn't dragging you down, creating or beefing up your emergency fund is a good idea, just in case. We really are stressed out about finances, uh, particularly at this time of year. New polling by Ipsos, exclusively for Global News, shows the number one thing people are worried about is money as holiday bills roll in. Nearly 70% say they can't absorb unexpected costs of $1,000 or more. About two-thirds worry they'll have to delay future plans or life projects, like buying a home or starting a family. 55% are anxious about being able to pay their full credit card bill. More than half fret about affording gas, as well as having enough to feed their family. Food inflation is expected to moderate, but prices will mostly keep rising in 2024. Experts suggest finding ways to reduce food waste and save money by avoiding prepared food. Whether it's watermelon that's already cut or it's meals that are already cooked and, and fresh that you can just warm up. Definitely a great convenience, but you pay a premium for that convenience. Remember, recession-proofing your finances means sticking to your investment plan, even if the headlines make you nervous. Even though you might be reading extra, extra, there's a recession in Canada, 
stock markets can be going up. Stocks tend to look six months down the road and anticipate what's to come, not what is in the past. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. When a sandwich is not just a sandwich, still ahead, the latest culinary trend sparking lineups in Montreal. Montreal's culinary scene may be best known for its bagels and smoked meat, but there's a new trend sweeping the city. Italian sandwich shops are popping up all over, drawing huge lineups of hungry customers. As Dan Spector reports, while business has never been better, the tradition started long ago. It's not even noon, and the lineup at Bosa in Verdun is already starting to swell. Day after day, crowds gather to devour chef and founder Daniel Lomanto's succulent sandwiches. It's like controlled chaos, almost like a ballet or a dance. Now in its sixth year, the shop pumps out hundreds of sandwiches daily. On a sunny day, people line up down the block for Lomento's Italian-inspired creations. Just like a really nice feeling. It's emotional. It's like incredible to see everybody here lining up for like the food that you've created. The winning formula here is one that's been refined over generations. A key inspiration, his grandfather, Pasquale Vecchio, who emigrated to Canada from Italy in the 60s. He came here with three kids, a wife, no money in his pocket. Business is also booming a few kilometers away at Clark Cafe, where Frank Servadio pays tribute to his late grandfather with every scrumptious sandwich. That's my grandfather, Salvatore. The late Salvatore Servadio founded Boulangerie Clark in 1980. It was an Italian community staple for 35 years. I just always had like the idea of bringing the Clark brand back. The sky-high popularity of both Clark and Bosa has contributed to an explosion of modern, Italian-inspired sandwich and coffee shops opening across Montreal. Strip away the chic design and glossy Instagram posts and you get the NDG Bakery, founded in 1974 by the late Vito De Vito. He started like maybe eight, nine years old as a baker. It's still run by Vito's children who work tirelessly to honor his vision. The tomato pizzas, breads, and pastries play a starring role, but Angie Cianflone will make you a sandwich that can compete with any other. Martitella, capco, salami, and cheese, and he took some hot peppers. Nikki DeVito is not surprised the art of the Italian sandwich is finding a new audience in Montreal. It's like a classic. You're having a sandwich, it's different. You know, you're going to have a prosciutto sandwich, you're going to have a, a chicken cutlet. So whether you prefer to be served Italian perfection by one generation or another, Rest assured that there's a healthy serving of family history and tradition in every bite. Dan Spector, Global News, Montreal. Unusual ice sport, next. How winter isn't taking the wind out of an Alberta man's sails. In a winter where skiers and snowboarders are lamenting the lack of snow, there is one sport that is celebrating the conditions, ice sailing. Never heard of it? Well, neither had we. And what might strike you as equally curious is the place it's taking off, landlocked Alberta. Sarah Ryan takes us aboard. Lowell Ross has been ice sailing in and around Edmonton for the last 35 years. You're taking something that isn't really a boat. It looks more like a narrow hull, or like in my case, it looks more like a platform. And you've got two blades back and one in the front. And you're using uh, sails, yes. He says ice sailing is an adrenaline rush. Once you have your momentum built up, there's a real thrill of traveling at 20, 30, 40, 50 K. But the conditions have to be just right. You need at least four inches of barren ice and at minimum a steady 15 kilometer an hour breeze. This winter's lack of snow has also been excellent. Particularly Cooking Lake and some of the other ones around here are quite shallow so they could freeze up and technically uh, you could be on the ice sailing even in October. Ross thinks if more people knew about the sport, they'd become addicted to the thrill. Once they've tried it, and realize that it's not an exotic, expensive sport. They might get the bug. That was certainly the case for New York resident Paul Chamberlain. I always look forward to an opportunity to go ice boating and we'll actually drive thousands of miles to make it happen. 
This fall, Chamberlain drove from Albany, New York, to an ice boat builder in Detroit, to an ice boat swap meet in Minneapolis, and then finally to St. Paul, Alberta, for the perfect ice. There's still no saleable ice down here. Well, we used to get it mid-December, uh, but with the warming trend in the world here, we're, we're, we're no longer getting it till, till January. He recently started getting into competitive races. Even when you're going slow, like 15 miles an hour, it's still fun. And when you're going 40 miles an hour, it's still fun, but you're starting to be a little nervous. They always wear helmets, just in case. Hoping to see the sport grow, Chamberlain plans to host an Alberta Ice Sailing Cup next fall. If we have two people, great. If we have 20 people, that'd be better. So very much looking forward to promoting uh, ice boating in Alberta. Sarah Ryan, Global News. And that is Global National for this New Year's Day. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. Tonight's Year Canada is a chilly challenge and a New Year's tradition. Oh, you're braver than me. Canadians put last year on ice with a polar bear plunge, dipping themselves into frigid waters despite sub-zero temperatures across most of the country. Thanks for watching. Hope you'll join us again tomorrow night.